What up, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, Jesse Warden here. Today, I'm going to talk about step functions. Jesse Warden. It is my most fun, awesome tool I've found in the past five years. It's specifically for Amazon Web Services. And today, we're going to do a deep dive into it. And we're going to cover what they are. What are step functions? Why would you actually use them? We'll cover about three valid use cases. They do really, really well. And then we'll go about how. So we'll kind of mix the two. And we're going to give you a little bit of background about why you would need these things too, because there's a lot of underpinnings that it's assumed you already know if you do step functions. My promise to you is by the end, you'll feel very confident building large orchestration APIs and write JavaScript that's much more likely to work. When it doesn't, you'll immediately know why. That's what step functions can bring you. And by the end of this video, you'll learn all this and feel confident enough to do those things using step functions. So when we talk about step functions, what are they? (laughs) They're a low code serverless microservice orchestration that uses finite state machines. What? What did he just say? It's a keyword soup. We'll walk through it. It allows you really, in one sentence, it allows you to wire AWS things together. So AWS has a lot of services that they manage, Lambda, SQS, SNS, Batch, EC2s, all these things to build a variety of software. Some they manage, some you host yourself. And AWS Step Functions allow you to bring all these things together in a very predictable way using what's called low code. Low code is a tool that's primarily visual, but it'll generate code behind the scenes. And then you as a developer can finish it. It's very different from no code, which is a tool, some of which like Salesforce and others offer where you can generate code, but you can't touch the code that it outputs. It's specifically there and you can't modify it. So low code is more for developers, software developers, people like us who are nerds who want to write code, but some of the stuff we're not only interested in generating, a UI could probably generate better for us. And you write it in primarily JSON. You can do it in YAML too. They're using the AWS CDK. You can write these things in TypeScript, in C Sharp, in Python if you want to. But I recommend JSON and YAML for the, the tool that allows you to, to generate it. And it's visual. You can see it run, succeed, and fail. Where did it fail? How did it succeed? What were the steps that go through it? And that's the auditability of it. You can see what happened during the life cycle. It's very similar to like when you have a breakpoint in your code or logs everywhere and you can kind of see the story that your code tells. Step functions tell you exactly what happened, which is amazing. And it can retry anything. Anything that happens, a Lambda, you're calling a server, you're calling another step function, you're writing to Dynamo, you're reading files from a bucket. Every single one of those operations can probably fail. And if it does, you can retry. And that's amazing. You don't have to write code that retry is just HTTP or whatever. It's, it's one of the most amazing things for it. And again, there's other cool things like you can parallelize things. You can do two things at once. You can compose a lot of these other step functions together. And lastly, they can run for a very long time, up to a year, which is very fantastic for either running processes that need to happen all the time, not using like event bridge or what used to be known as CloudWatch, or you're waiting on people, which is really hard for software. So let's dive into every single one of those because that's a a lot of keyword soup. So low code, if you're not familiar, is a, almost all of them have to do with a visual tool that you see. Blockly is the perfect example. This is how a lot of kids and adults learn how to code. They take these blocks like Legos and they snap them together in these shapes that do some kind of operation. And behind the scenes, it's generating code, JavaScript, Python, whatever. This particular one, if you go to Blockly Games, you can drag these things together, get this character to the end of the maze, and eventually it teaches you how this program runs. You understand the logic of before and after, time, bugs. The code runs, but it doesn't work. Like, so the difference between running and working and debugging, all that stuff. And it's all from this visual tool. That's how they start. They don't actually write code, but they use this tool that generates the code so they can learn how to code. Another one is Datadog. Datadog is a dashboard monitoring system. A lot of times we use it with Amazon Web Services just because the the tooling around Datadog to visualize your infrastructure, your lambdas, your servers, and see what's happening, the various aspects of them. You don't have to learn D3, which is a very popular graphing library for JavaScript. You don't have to learn that. You can just drag and drop these grids, tie them to your various lambdas or groups of lambdas, step functions, SQS, and all your other server-related stuff in a single place And then you can set up monitors. So if it goes too high in CPU, or maybe you've got too many files on your bucket, whatever those thresholds are, you can set that and then it'll page you. So when I, when I, like my lambdas are having a a rise, a significant rise over a period of time of failures, I'll get paged on my phone. It'll text me and say, yo, 
your server got a problem. And that's stuff that I would want to know about proactively. Datadog all, does all that. I don't have to write any code. So one could argue there's no code, but they provide an SDK. There's ways of tweaking each one of these variables. So it, it kind of veers towards no code, but they, they still have the ability to write code if you wanted to. So Datadog is another perfect example of low code that adds a lot of value to developers. Advent of Code is a coding challenge that starts December 1st every year and runs every single day until December 31st. And the goal is to complete two code challenges a day that get progressively harder, especially on the weekends. And what you do is you kind of fill out a picture for that year, and it also is a story of helping save Santa Claus or Christmas. There's a theme around it. And so people will use that as an opportunity to get better at the programming language they know. They'll also use it to learn a new language because they're forced to do a variety of different code challenges. But some people will do crazy things and they'll use things like Excel, for example. So here's Excel and they will write formulas and whatnot, but notice how it visualizes the trees. So off to the left, these dots represent a place you can walk. These hash symbol or pound symbols, they indicate trees. And then the red is the path that you need to take and you need to count how many trees. Now, normally that would require math. You would draw a grid uh, or a multi-dimensional array. There's a lot, of, a lot of ways to solve this, maybe from for loops or a map, reduce to go through what is your path and what did you hit. They did all that without code. They used Excel, which has code, right? You can do sum, difference, financial equations. And as of December of last year, 2020, it has Lambda functions. So you can do code, but it's low code. You, you write in cells and then behind the scenes modify those formulas, right? It's very reactive. So that's another low-code example. Excel is amazing. It's used for a variety of things like that. All right, so that's what low-code is, not to be confused with no-code. No-code is solutions where you can build an application very similar to Amazon's Honeycode, where you can build applications. Now, again, like Datadog, you can argue that it's low-code because there is the ability to use SDK and scrape it. But for the most part, that's not how it works. That's a low-code. So state machines, if you've never heard of state machines, you'll see them everywhere very similar to when you first learn about object-oriented programming and everything's a class. State machines are very similar. So the one we all know is a light switch. And the way a light switch works is you turn it on or off. And there's only real two states, assuming you always have power. There's two states that it could possibly be in, on or off. And so the way you would model that step functions is you would have a pass state that says, I am gonna go to the state, I'm on or you'd have another state that says off. So on or off, it can only be one of those states. Now how you get between those states is what we call transitions. So every state machine has a set of states that it can be in and how you transition between those states. In a light switch this case, you have an on or an off state, so two states, and the transition is when you flip the switch to either state, that's the transition. That's how you get from on, that's how you get from on to off, okay? So that's a really simple one. Now this one, illustrates the problem with state machines and with coding in general, but state machines, it's a lot easier to visualize and see. And that is what we call exponential state. If you've ever done programming where you've had a Boolean flag and then had to add another one, then you realize you used to have just true or false. It was only two possible states, but then you have another Boolean friend flag that relates. Now you have four because it's true or false. True, this is false, false, true, right? And they all interrelate. So it becomes infinitely more complex. So this is a perfect example. This door, can open or close, so two states that we clearly understand, but it can also be locked. But what happens when the door is like this? It's locked, but you have the door open and you try to close it. You don't want that to have happen, and that can happen. So using the state machine, for example, we have a start and an end state where we're trying to close the door. So the other light switch, there's no end state. It's always on or always off, but this door has an end state of closing. That's what we want to have happen. So if the door is open, and the door is locked and we try to close it, it won't work. So that's why we go to this whoops unlock door state. We don't want to allow the user to get into that really bad state. So we go, can't close the door and you gotta try again. So every time you try to close the door, you, you gotta make sure, are you unlocked? If you're not, you're gonna loop around. So this ensures we can't allow the state machine to get in a place that we don't want it to be. So you, when you're modeling these state machines, you don't have to model it with, to allow the bad. You can model it to only allow what you want. And that's the good, the things that you know about in the good happy pass. This helps ensure that only happy pass can happen. And if they don't, you can barely clearly see where it is. It's only one place or few places, right? You want to keep them small. So if I unlock the door, then try to close it, it'll work. And the door is closed and locked, right? Then I can lock it once it's closed. 
All right, so if another one which would be even bigger is when you have two possible states you can be in, which have their own state machines, and that's called a hierarchical state machine. So here's an example of a siege tank from StarCraft II. StarCraft II is an online game where you control army units and you're trying to attack aliens and there's a lot of strategy involved and each unit is typically better than others, paired with others. Very, very complex. The game epitomizes the ability to move your mouse and keep a lot of things in your head. So this tank has a very unique ability unlike most tanks that we're familiar with in the modern age. This tank allows you to extract its tread in these four kind of legs then it has two other legs, so it has six points that retract and keep it a nice steady platform, and it becomes an artillery. The main gun is called a shot cannon, and it aims up, and it can shoot really far, and it's very powerful as long as you have line of sight. But it can't shoot nearby because of the, the radius of the explosion. And so this is called siege mode. So what it'll do is you can't move, but you can constantly acquire targets. It'll just sit there and acquire targets. If it finds one, it'll fire the shot cannon, it takes about three to four seconds to reload it. Then you can acquire more targets if you would like, and it keeps firing. So you don't touch it. It just sits there and fires, reloads. And so notice that reload has a stopwatch. Think of that as like it's going to take some time. So we want to transition back to fight or flight, but we can't. It takes a minute. You're not allowed to go there first. The transition is after you fire, you need to wait. Then you can go back. So that's that three seconds there. Now, if you want to disable siege mode so you can drive around again, you can. And so that's the second state. When you have the legs retracted and you just have your, your tank tread and your, basically your tank tread wheels, you can move around, but you can do something different. You can also fire. So you can move and fire or run and gun at the same time. You can't do that in siege mode. You can't move. And you can't shoot nearby. But this one allows you to fire the, the dual cannon, which is just simple, not as powerful, but you can shoot and move backwards at the same time. So it's a, a very good from a mobile perspective. You can shoot really close if there's infantry units right next to you. And so this state machine shows that you can do two states at once. Those two states are called being in parallel. You're doing both of these states at the same time. You're existing in two states at once, right? So I'm moving my hands and talking while I talk to you, right? That's two states at once. It's communicating, right? Body language is communicating in addition to the mouth. That's two states at once. So it's tank, same thing. And as long as you're still alive, you can keep doing those things. So that's two state machines that this tank could be in. But it's the same tank. So how do you represent that? It's a hierarchical state machine if you want to do both. And that is you have another step function or another state machine that represents that, that we just showed you. And if you want to go from tank mode into siege mode where you can shoot really powerful and really far away, but you can't move, then you have to extend your stabilizer, which takes about three seconds. Then you're ready to go. But you can't move. If infantry's coming towards you and they're too close to shoot at them, then you want to retract your stabilizers and go to tank mode. So it's a way most programmers, when the complexity gets really high, what do you normally do? You abstract the code away. Whether you're in object-oriented programming or you're in functional programming, you're going to abstract those details away. So you can see we've abstracted how the tank mode works. We've abstracted how the siege mode works. And we have them together in a single state machine that toggles between them and with certain rules. That's what's called a hierarchical state machine, where you have a bunch of state machines within it. Now for the real world, let me give you a real world example. So in object-oriented programming, we take classes and we represent things in the real world. So for example, this here is a Thermocell MR450. And what it does is it allows you to go outside, whether in the woods or in the backyard, and you don't have to have bugs, mainly mosquitoes, bother you. This little blue thing right here, if I can get it out, what it does is it has a chemical on it. And if you heat it up pretty hot, it does this mist for about four to six hours, and it, the bugs hate it. And it can, as long as it's not too windy, it can go in a 15-foot radius and keep all the bugs away. And so it's fantastic. So this would be the thermocell itself, and it has batteries internally. What you do is you hit the start button a couple times, you wait three seconds, and the chemical at the bottom will ignite, and you'll be able to see the little light there. So you hit the start, which is a little electricity thing to start the fire, and inside it's got a little, little fire going. That'll heat up this metal pad, and then burn the little bug thing, right? So the, the chemicals go away. Now, the way that works is it's, it's just like object-oriented programming where you have classes that represent a thing and then you have other things that are other classes that represent them with their internal state. So for example, this has a battery inside of it with how much power and it has two extension slots or getters and setters that you can actually attach things and operations that affect the internal state of the device.
And so you abstract that away in that class internally. That's what we call composing functions via composition. We compose classes via composition internally of the classes. And so we would take the cap off this thing, you put it in the bottom, screw it in, and that gives it fuel. So while it has power to start the fire, you need fuel for the fire. And you can see that there's liquid down there that'll burn for about eight hours. Once you turn it on, let me put the bug thing back in there for you. So I'm gonna slide that in. Now you can hear it hissing. And we're gonna wait three seconds. And I don't know if you can see the little slot there. We're gonna hit start three times. I'm gonna look real quick, see if I can see it. You should be able to see a little orange light in there. I'm not sure if you can see it right there, but that means it's inside. So we've done a bunch of functionality with a bunch of components. Very typical for UI development, where you have a class that represents some piece of thing or capability or component that can do things. It manages its internal state. The fuel has how much fuel it has left. It has an attachment point to go inside of the thermocell. The thermocell has a battery inside that has how much power you can do for the start button. The blue bug sheet that you put in there has a lifetime of how long it'll work. And as long as you have fuel, and as long as you have this, and as long as it's on and burning, you can get the bugs away. And so that's how we have a bunch of classes that handle, abstract their own functionality. You put them together, and they make this wonderful, wonderful machine. It's very similar to step functions. That's what, that's what they can do. So we can turn it off or turn it on. So hierarchical state machine with classes, you can use the state pattern if you're an object-oriented programmer, very similar effect. Functional programming uses composition as well. It's just slightly different on how you do it. Instead of putting things inside of things, you actually wire them together like pipes. So for example, if we're trying to parse some JSON, for example, we would put that, then we would put that inside of another function that then parses or filters out the people from that list. And then once we got the people, we want to format the names of that list of people so we can see who those names are. We don't care about objects anymore. We just need a list of strings, right? And that formatting. The easier way to do that in other languages is either using the new stage two proposal for pipeline operator, compose and lodash, promise, pose them together to build bigger functions. So this one function, parse people names, will do all of that together. And so it's very similar. So step functions are very similar to that too. You take a bunch of Lambda functions, a bunch of AWS servers, you put them together in a line or a series of states that get inputs and outputs, and you wire them together in something larger in a state machine that's greater than its whole. That, that functionality. For example, let's take a Lambda function. It has an input and an output. And the way Lambda functions work is you, a lot of people will treat them as whole applications called lambda list and monoliths, but let's really go for the Lambda function. Lambda means like from Lambda calculus, one input, one output. So let's go with that definition and treat it as a real function, not a gigantic application. What this is going to do is get an event from an HTTP call. It's going to go in as an event JSON, and what's going to come out is a true or false. If it's true, we're good to go. If it's false, maybe we'll throw an exception, maybe we'll return a Boolean. The easier way is, is input-output. Exceptions don't really work because there's no other way out of the pipe. You can't really explode the pipe. It's not, you can do that in some functional languages, but we're going to pretend this is a pure functional language, and so we have an input and output. So if you have an event, it comes in this Lambda, and comes out, and we know it's legit, it's, it's true, then that means that event's good. Take this lambda, put it down for a minute. We're gonna create another lambda. This lambda, what it's gonna do is take that event and parse some data from it. And if the data is legit, we're gonna put it in the database. So the event is good, we know that's good. We just gotta parse out the data from that event that is legit. We just need to pull out the pieces and format it the way we want, and then insert it, be ready to be put in the database. So we're going to take that event inside, and outside will come the data that we want to put in the database. That database is DynamoDB. So we want to take that data, put it in DynamoDB, and then DynamoDB will let us know that it worked or not. Okay? So how do we wire these together? Well, in functional programming, you use something like a pipe. But in Amazon, you're going to use a step function. A step function basically says how you wire those things together in a particular order. So this tank one we had before, you notice how it goes from top to bottom and then it kind of loops around. We're gonna do a very similar one, it's just top to bottom and it has a de definitive end state. Not all state machines have to have a, an end state. The first thing we wanna do is do that valid event. And then the next thing we wanna do is we wanna pipe or take the output of, from this Lambda function here and we want it to go to something else. Well, that next Lambda, it's parsing the event. So we're gonna attach that together. So now we have these two Lambdas. These two lambdas are connected together via this step function, and he's going to route it at the end. So what comes in is an event, and it validates it, 
then it makes sure, okay, if it's valid, it's going to go into the one that parses it, parses out the data. The data is going to come out here. Lastly, we need to connect that to Dynamo. So now, this is our step function, aka our application, aka a larger function, except it's not necessarily a function. It's a step function that's kind of like an application, right? It's got an input and an output. It, you input an event, and it outputs I wrote to the database. You see how that works? And there's a lot more than just these connectors. So for example, what happens if something breaks in validate event? Like what if the event's bad? Like what do you do? Well, you have a choice. It either works or it doesn't. It's a Boolean operation, right? In functional programming, you don't throw. You basically, very similar to Golang or Lua, you say if it worked or not. So you have the option here of saying what happens. If it worked, cool. But if it didn't, what happens at this error state? You have an option there. You can retry. You can say to the user, I didn't work, and here's why. You could have that Lambda format. There's a lot of things you could do. Those options are there. And the step functions allow you to orchestrate all these Amazon pieces. And you choose how you wire these things together, OK? So it's not just Lambda and Dynamo. It's pretty much everything on AWS. So that's basically the, the concept. So that's how it works in functional programming, putting these pipes together, oop, classes together, you're abstracting state. Step functions are like that. They orchestrate all these things together. So whether you're from an object-oriented programming background and you know about the state pattern, or you're from a functional programming, it should make a lot of sense on how you would compose these applications and infrastructure pieces together. All right, so let's give you a demo. When you get to the main console, we're gonna type in step functions so you don't have to search around. Down here, you click step functions. And you'll see the word off to the left, state machine. State machines are just another way of saying step functions in AWS nomenclature. So if you hear the word step function, it means a state machine. If you hear the word state machine, it means a step function. They're the same thing. And down here, I have all the step functions we talked about. So let's go to locked door. So I think that's probably the, the best one here. And if you click on definition, I'm going to zoom out just a little so we can get some more room here. You see how it, 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 these states are over here, but over here is the actual code for it? So I didn't write this code by hand. It generates it. Now, there are a lot of people that will use things like Terraform and CDK and others to dynamically change these things for good reason. They're trying to deploy to east and west. They're trying to dynamically hit the functions. They don't want to hard code the Lambda arms. There's a lot of reasons to dynamically choose that. The downside of that is that you lose the ability to do low code with it. So I highly recommend you try to find other tools to work on top of that so you can keep that low code workflow. Now, obviously, there's no way to save from currently the Amazon console to your desktop, but there are ways of at least generating this in an automated way to get it. So try to, try to keep that around. I highly recommend it. But you can see that this step function's here, and it has the ARN and the IAM role that allows it to do things. So that, that IAM role allows the step function to interface with those certain things, such as invoke a Lambda. It doesn't mean that it can do everything the Lambda can do. So you still have that security around, I don't have a large surface area because the step function can call those things, but it doesn't magically have access to all the things the Lambda does. So for example, if the Lambda is allowed to access Dynamo, that doesn't mean the step function can access Dynamo. It has to do through, through the Lambda function and only the inputs the Lambda function allows. And vice versa, the Lambda doesn't magically incur the abilities that the step function has. He just has an input and output. So you still get that level of security and pain in the neck <laughs> that you get with IAM roles. Those are still there. So let's, let's take a look here. See this execution? That's when you run a step function. So every time you run it, just like when you invoke a function, that's called an execution. So back in the Windows days, we would execute files. When you run your code, you go node, index.js, or Python, main pi. That's an execution. You're running your code, and it either works, runs forever, or stops. Step functions are the same way, except they don't run forever. They run for a year. And they will run until you tell them to stop, they'll run until the time runs out, or they'll run until they have an error, or it su succeeds, it just stops, goes in an end state, for example. So we're going to run start execution. And if you see the word function and step function, that's because they have inputs, like a regular function. You give them JSON. So everything that goes through all this stuff is generally JSON. You can use strings. It's just a convention that everyone does JSON, even with like this one property, right? It's just a common convention. So we're going to do locked, and we're going to say the door is locked. It's going to start locked. And you see this name up here? That's what's called a, a UID, or sometimes called a GUID, but it's a UID v4. 
version four, which means that it's a randomly generated string number thing. And that way, every time you run a step function, you have a unique UID that represents that run. So if you ever want to find it again, you got that unique name. Now you can put whatever name you want here. It's got to be unique. Sometimes for unit tests, for example, or integration tests, I'll put test dash in front of it. So it's unique. But when I'm scanning a list of executions, I can tell the difference between real executions and unit tests that I ran on the QA environment, for example. So we're going to say start execution. It's going to take this JSON, start a next uh, step function and put that input in it. So if you look at this, see how it's running right now? If you look at execution input, you'll see that it, it in, inputted lock. The problem is, is that you can't close a locked door. So you look at the output when it's done, it's false. So think of step functions very similar to a Lambda function. You have an input and an output. It, or in object oriented programming, you call a method and you get a return value from that method. It's the same concept. So we had an input of true, it unlocked the door and then allowed us to go to closed. So let's do it again. So this time we'll say false. Start execution. And it immediately went to succeeded. We didn't have to wait. And the reason it did that is because it started in an unlocked phase. So I didn't have to unlock it. I, I got to close it immediately because it's unlocked. And so you can see it skipped these other steps. And it's green because it worked. It successfully transitioned to that other state. Okay, These colors mean it worked. In progress, it would be blue, things that take a while. Sometimes a lambda function is taking a while off server. Who knows? And it's not always the service is taking long. It could be the step function is waiting for a status update. So there's not always a correlation between speed. Don't, don't get too caught up on the latency. And orange would be you caught an error, like try catch. Red would be failed. All right, so when it ran, every one of those steps where I started here, I went to this state via transition, I exited this state to the other state in a transition. Each one of those is a documented transition. Every single one of those is documented in this, what's called the execution event history. And you can see there's a lot of stuff that happens to go from start to the choice state. Like you start it, but then you enter the past state and then you exit the past state. So each one of those transitions is a very lockstep deterministic process. And it's great because you can see what happened, exactly what order, how long it took. And if it's a service, you can actually link to logs and other stuff. We'll show that in a, a few minutes. And if you want to see what the input was and what the output was, you can see that as it passes that input through the entire thing. So we're going to do a pass state. It's still locked false. And it went through the whole, whole way. If we looked at the execution history of the previous one, so let's go to locked door, the one right before two. If we click this one and go see where it can't close the door and it unlocks the door. Let's scroll down to unlock the door. We'll go, whoops, unlock the door. So it came in with locked of true, but then it unlocked it. And so that shows how the data comes in and comes out. And you can see what's happening in your out output. Now, that's because it got passed in a boolean and changed it. But you can output whatever you want. You don't have to output what you got. You can do whatever you want. And that's the step function is really good at massaging this JSON. We'll talk about JSON path in a bit, too. All right, so that's how you can see step functions. You know that the green makes it work. And you can see the path that it went through. And this execution event history will update reasonably real time. Each state you can click on and see the details of what happened with it, what was the actual step input and output. So again, we, we scroll down to execution history. If you click on whoops on locked door, you can see that it started with true and exited with false. Cool? All right, now let's, let's touch on JSON path real quick. The data flow simulator, there's this language called JSON path which allows you to do basic logic because sometimes you're interfacing with lambdas or services that you didn't write. And they might have weird, they might have okay inputs, but the outputs they're giving you are like strange JSON that you might only need one node. You don't need all this stuff. Sometimes it's good data, but it's in the wrong place. Like you need to attach it to what you already have. Sometimes what you already have is good. You need to pull that off and then combine it. And all this is data massaging that you would have to do in code using something like manual dot syntax. You could use a lens library like low dash git or set. You could use, uh, there's a lot of them for JavaScript and Python. And that's a lot of work. It's easier to let the step function do it because you don't have to worry about code bugs. It'll tell you it won't even compile unless the code bug works. For the most part, you still might have dynamic data weirdness if the objects don't exist. So the data flow simulator, you can go through the entire thing to say, I want to get a particular impact input of what's coming in. If I'm calling a Lambda, I don't care about the input. I got to give it very custom parameters that have nothing to do with the output I got previously. When I get the results, I want to verify and change things. The selector allows you to take that result and do some transformations to it. The path is where you want it 
to, to go. The output path is very similar, except it's the, the path of where you can filter before the final input versus result path is like, where, where is it going? Like on this dot place. And then the actual output. So you can see the, the changes that you're allowed to do on filtering that data before it comes out one lambda and goes to another. A lot of that simulator, you can put the data in there and see it in real time as you change the data. Now notice this one was pretty slow because we had to go through things. There's this thing called X-ray. If you've ever heard of distributed tracing, it's not as good as something like Jaeger, Prometheus, for example, but it's basic. It works out of the box. It, it works with all other services. It automatically handles all the correlation IDs between all the lambdas and dynamos and blah, blah, blah. So you don't have to do any of that work. So it's still fantastic to get it for free. So if you click it, it'll open up the X-ray console and you can see what happened. Now these are gonna be really quick, right? It's gonna go to these states like instantly fast. So you can see even calling basic states are fast. But once you start having lambdas in there and HTTP calls, you can see which lambda in particular had a slow startup time because a lot of code, maybe had some HTTP calls, who knows? And so those are all in there. Let's, let's look at one that does that. We'll go to the decompose API, for example. And we'll go to, I think all these are failed. Yeah, so this one validates request. Let's take a look at the x-ray, it failed. And you can see this particular one failed for whatever reason. It got an input of true, but then had some kind of exception. So this is the exception from the actual Lambda. You can see the errors on the thing. You can also get more details if you can scroll down here. And it, notice it was a Lambda. We can link to the CloudWatch logs directly, which is fantastic. So if, if you know the Lambda configuration is wrong, you can click that particular one. If you know it's, you don't know what's wrong, you can go to the logs and kind of investigate. So see this one has a couple issues. It's, it's slow for this perspective, and then it has an error. And we can see each one of the latency and the very similar to the browser. When you're opening the timeline in the browser, you can see in a waterfall of like it downloaded the file, executed the JSON or executed the JavaScript. It took an HTTP call, took a while. You can see all of that for every single Lambda, for every single state in a big tree that starts top to finish. So it's really easy to see where the latency is coming from. And sometimes it's from multiple places. And this gives you a really holistic view around it. But then you can dive deeper if you want to see what particular one. So it, it's for free, just add it to your IAM roll, basic x-ray stuff. Right, now let's, let's do the last thing. The last thing is when you wanna create a new state machine. So we're gonna edit this one. Now this is the old editor. You could write here, format the JSON, and it would update in real time here. But the workflow studio is really where low code definition really shines because you can use the IDE to build it, right? The, the tool to build it the state machine, and it'll generate that code for you. And all those JSON blocks have a UI based now. So you don't have to type anything. You can't possibly screw it up. You just select from here. And if you do, the validation will tell you what you messed up. So we're going to click on Lambda here. And you can see the name of the state that it has, what function it's calling by the ARN. If you want to go make sure it's the right function, you can click view. And you can do the default payload, whatever the HTTP or however somebody invokes it, whatever that JSON, it's going to use the default, but you could change it. And where does it go next? You just go parallel. So by default, it'll choose a new drag and drop, for example. So if I have a new Lambda, I can just drag and add a new, new place. It'll automatically update this one, automatically updates to go to the next one. And it's assumed by default that whatever this Lambda spits out, it'll put as the input to this one. And whatever his output is, will go to the next parallel state. Parallel state, you can put things in it so they'll all run at the same time. If you think like promise.all, for example, or in Python, that would be gather, I think, without the for loop concept. And so that's, that's how you build basic things and, and pretty much everything in Amazon that it supports from an integration perspective works down here. So a lot of the machine learning stuff like glue, other step functions, if you want to abstract your stuff, you can spin up an ECS cluster. If you already have one running, you can run a task on it. If you need to spin up a cluster temporarily, you can use batch instead. So you just think of like a bunch of containers you want to spin up. If you want to do API gateway, you can make HTTP calls to other REST calls. No need to write the REST call your stuff. That's what I mean by batch. Some of the Athena stuff, if you're trying to do S3 searches of just data on S3, Athena's pretty cool for that. A lot of the code build stuff, so Amazon's versions of like Team City or Jenkins, how they kind of deploy code. Direct access to basic queries in Dynamo. You don't have to write it. You can literally do the query here, which is fantastic. Their error handling needs work though. Just be aware that some of the, the, the try catch isn't as simple as it may seem because if you're missing a node you're looking for, it doesn't always work the way you're expecting. You can, their version of Kubernetes, EKS, you can start up some of those things. A lot of the EMR stuff or like machine learning, these are really beastly to start up and, and shut down. So step functions are great. Sometimes to just start them up and know what happened right from the output. A lot of the machine learning game with SageMaker. 
And lastly, the, the really cool ones are activity is when you're trying to interface with something that's not like an ECS run task, for example. So you already have a server out there. They can look at your state machine if it has some work and it'll get a token, do the work and then say, I'm done, attach it to that token message. The state machine can get a response from that. And the, it doesn't run forever. It actually can send heartbeats to make sure that server that has that task is still alive. Conversely, you can do the same thing with SQS and SNS. So think of it like I'm going to send a message on SQS and whenever somebody handles that message on the queue, I'll know about it. And that could take up to a year, which is great. SNS though is really cool because that's where you send like text messages and emails. And so they have to respond to that. A real person has to respond to it and your step function can wait for it. So fantastic stuff. So that gives you a deep dive into this stuff. You can see the definition, the blocks and things like that. Again, I, I do it in JSON. Some people do it in YAML. So that's the basics of the step function. So let's dive in to one more. Let's take a look at the, uh, the tank and siege mode real quick. So you can see the siege mode of like the different states that it had to go through and it has a definitive in state. And then what you would do is you would attach both those step functions together using the, let's go into this one and edit it. And then you would actually drag another state machine in there and then point to that state machine with inputs of what you want and what does that state machine output. So that's your crash course in the step functions on Amazon demo mode. Let's go back to the presentation. I'll give you some, some good use cases of why do we use these crazy things? What are they, what are they good for? So what step machines are really good for, AWS, are orchestrating microservices. And if you're not familiar with what I mean by microservices on Amazon, microservices are a very loose term. Most people say they're small services that are independently deployable of a larger mechanism or, or service or application. But that's not really what we're focused on. We're going we're gonna to narrow down the definition a little bit. So I'm going to give you a background if you don't know what I mean by serverless microservices on Amazon, which are generally lambdas. They're not, a lot of people associate Fargate with servers as a serverless way of doing it, but that's infrastructure and things like that. I'm more focused on serverless where there's no server involved and I'm just doing Lambda functions and step functions. So let's, let's cover the basics of that. So here's some JavaScript. You would traditionally do an ExpressJS server on a server somewhere or Fastify or Restify, for example, or Co all the other ones. And you're gonna validate the request. And that's just a side effect. You don't really care about the return value. You're just like, do it. If you don't throw, I guess it worked, right? Then you're going to do two things at once. You're going to create a user from that request. You're going to read off the data that they submitted, verify that it's safe and it's good. But you're also going to generate a user email for this service that they're signing up for because there's a lot of emails and it's easier just to generate one for them because they're part of a master account. So there's not like Gmail where like you don't, you're just part of Gmail and you have your own account. This is more for like an organization like Salesforce, you're on an account. And so you have to generate that. So rather than waiting, we're gonna do both at once because we can do it from a request. It doesn't have to be associated with account, right? It's in a, a NoSQL database. So once both of those return, it doesn't matter what order we're using promise at all. So we get the user first and the email second. It doesn't matter how long those take. It, when they're both done and both successful, we get the user and email. So we're not gonna do all set or set old or catch or any of that. Next, we need to set a user's free period on how they can use this service for 30 days, 60 days, whatever it is. But we need to do some check to make sure they haven't used the same email and try to get an account again, for example, try to extend the account. Assuming that's good, we send a confirmation email. All that will do, that confirmation email, is confirm that their account's actually been verified. So they're still welcome to use it. They have a working account. They have a working email. They can use it. We're just interested from if they're trying to make security changes to their account or something. We have a verified email address. That's all. And so that, that can take a while. But the user can immediately start using it, and that's fantastic. So that would be a normal block of monolith code that you would normally deploy. And traditional APIs like Express, that's how they work. So I took a lot of this from Jan C. If you're not familiar with him, he's a wonderful, wonderful blogger on serverless thought leader. He talks in a language I can understand. I have an art degree. So if I can understand it, like you're set. <laughs> he, he just, he speaks to the people. He speaks with nuance too. It's not very dogmatic. So I, I just love, love how he covers things. So traditional APIs, this image is illustrating that re Express, Django and Python or Flask, for example, they're all responsible for parsing the route. When you hit a URL in the browser, they're responsible for parsing that and saying, what route are we doing? Are you doing a Git request for people? Okay, then we're gonna go to the, the Git one. Is it a Git people slash one? Ah, that's a Git request, but it's looking for a specific person. So I gotta go to this function and pull that data instead, or this class method and pull that instead, right? If you're doing C-sharp, for example. 
And it just that all that code is in there. Sometimes you don't have to do it. You just do like in Express, for example, app.get, and it just points to a thing. In C Sharp and Python, you can actually annotate the methods of like, this is a get for this particular route. It goes to this function or this class method. And that's, that's pretty fantastic, but that's still kind of what you're supposed to do. And sometimes there's a lot of setup too, like cores and things like that. A lot of the serverless stuff has moved away from that. They, there's two things they've done. The first is they've offloaded that to the infrastructure. So whether it's an application load balancer or an API gateway, they don't do that. They, they, they just they handle all that in infrastructure. So you still have infrastructure as code, but that's usually a bunch of knobs and switches, whether that's in JSON or Terraform or using AWS console, but you don't write code for that. What you do is just write business logic. Now, business logic is a loose term because some people, that's all they do is they write business logic. Other people will use like the hexagonal architecture or also known as the onion architecture. Well, they'll have like adapters and domain logic inside and ports and all that stuff. And that's fine. Some people in that business logic will be a Lambda lift. It'll be the code I just showed you as an ExpressJS app because they're trying to learn serverless. And that's okay. It's a great way to learn. But the routes around it are usually very specific to a specific small function. And you're just deploying that one function. You're not deploying this whole app. Okay, so that's what I mean by serverless APIs. When I say that word, that's what I mean. The routing is not really handled by that. Which means that it used to be an application load balancer, a Route 53, an API gateway, whatever, would point to some EC2 instance. It's a server. It's either running a cluster or somewhere with some kind of Docker container that holds your app. Or you could be running on bare metal if you want to run Node on EC2, that's cool too. But generally, that's how it's done is Docker, just because that's the people like the containers and the easy ability to work on my machine kind of goes away and you get the a lot of benefits from that, right? So that's how it normally works. And you'd have a bunch of these things horizontally scaled. You have like three express containers, three servers, all managed by a cluster, and an ALB would kind of point to the one who has the lowest traffic, right? Service APIs work similarly in that you have one function that can be horizontally scaled, but they're pointing to a function. They're not pointing to a server or an instance or a container. It's literally just the function, the code up there. So normally what you would put in app.get goes in that. And then each route would go to a different function. Sometimes you have one API gateway, some you have many, sometimes you have one ALB, sometimes you have many. But the point is, is that you have many functions that do just one thing and one thing well, which there's a lot of debate. We'll talk about the dry thing. It makes dry really hard. It's basically impossible. And I know you can make libraries, but it's not as easy as it sounds. So what that means, if you've never done this kind of style before, is it's very similar to... Express, right? Somebody types a URL in the browser, in this case, API Gateway. It'll take that URL, but API Gateway takes that and converts it to JSON. Very similar to what Express will do. We'll get a web request and kind of parse it into JSON and hand it to your method. So the concept is very similar. It'll say an HTTP method is get. It's got a path of this in query parameters, but it gives you that. Express, Django, Flask, Spring Boot, they'll take it a step further and kind of parse that and call methods and do framework things. Lambda doesn't do any of that. It just gives you that as the event, the first and only parameter to your function. And then your job is to respond with an object that the caller understands. Now, what do I mean by caller? The caller is who invoked you. You're a Lambda function. Who invoked you? Who triggered you? That would be Amazon Gateway. So if Amazon Gateway triggered you, he's expecting an object back that looks like a web request. So that would be headers, body, and probably a status code of 200 or 201, whatever, whatever type of request. It is. So those are kind of the three things that you expect in JSON back. So that's how the, the, it works compared to like something like Express or something. A lot less code, a lot less more involved, a lot more overhead in finding all these functions, right? Like service discovery. So I'm, again, taking from the Bernie Monk, his, Yancey. He's got a really good article about the nuances of why you don't do Lambda to Lambda. And it's, not, it's considered an anti-pattern, but there are cases where it's not an anti-pattern. It's nuanced, right? But generally, you don't because they don't make a good interface. And what do I mean by that? So Lambda functions have a function R. It's a name that you can invoke them by. I'm going to invoke this function, just like you would in programming. But they also have versions. Those versions are immutable. So what version are you invoking? Just like when you npm install a node library, it has a version. And that version doesn't, you know, just because it updates doesn't mean your code breaks. Your package JSON and your package lock are saying another version. So just because they deploy something doesn't break your stuff. That's good. <laughs> we don't want that to happen. So when you invoke a Lambda function, you've got to define what you mean. Are you invo invoking the latest? And that's another thing, latest. What alias? The latest? Dev? QA? Prod? Staging? Like what, and the staging point to version 11? Like what does that mean exactly? 
So this is why we, we kind of fall back to REST. If you're not using GraphQL, you fall back to REST and say, look, we're just going to use API Gateway, ALB, have a URL and some specific version in that URL, whether it's the header or in the URL itself. So that way we have a good interface. That means the developers can do whatever they want under the function. They can change aliases and versions, and API Gate would still be pointing to the immutable one that still works, right? So that's why we, we say about versions and REST and API Gateway. And so that, that challenge of calling functions sometimes says, you know what? We can't do dry and no one else calls it. And we learned our domain and now we have like 20 functions, but we only need 16. So you start combining some that seem obvious, right? Rather than having Lambda, because if this one takes, let's say hundred seconds to boot up, and this one takes hundred milliseconds to boot up, this one has to wait 200 milliseconds for this guy to boot up and then return whatever it takes, assuming it takes hundred milliseconds to execute, which means you pay for 300 milliseconds. doesn't seem like a lot and it's not but that can add up when you start horizontally scanning to thousands of concurrent executions, lots of APIs. It gets quite like sometimes quadruply expensive, right? This is very, very bad practice. So it's better just to have one Lambda call thing, do something fast and exit out. So that means with APIs with servers, you can do the same thing with step functions. Instead of having an API gateway point to a function, it can point to a step function. And the reason you do that is because you want to call multiple functions. You don't want to combine them. They're good doing one thing and one thing well. I don't want to combine the create account and the generate email. They're two separate code bases. One's written in Go and one's written in JavaScript. Like, let's keep them separate, but then reserve the right to invoke them without that penalty. And that's where step functions come in because they can orchestrate that. But they can also do orchestration with Dynamo. You don't need to write code for that. So you kind of get that for free. So you get all this orchestration of being able to call these lambdas invoking other lambdas in certain particular orders in certain ways such as parallel with the added ability to do other services like Dynamo. And we'll talk about some of the additional benefits, but that's basically the concept is that instead of this API gateway pointing to a single Lambda, it just points to a single step function that may or may not do one to many Lambdas within it and other things, okay? Same concept. So the way it works is if you have a step function workflow, you would have your step function like we should do before and you'd have that validate request Lambda. So it'd get the input from the HTTP gateway. Remember that JSON we showed you? It's gonna put that in the validate request. So it's gonna get that as an event. The step function will forward it along. Whatever it outputs, true, false, it's gonna to go to that parallel state. And so that parallel state is gonna say, if it was true, we're good. If it's false, throw an error. So if it's true, that means the event coming in is good for create user to use, and it's good for generate user email to use. That's fantastic. So it's gonna run both those functions at the same time. Think like promise.all. So it's gonna give the same event, that's how parallel works, same event, same input to two different Lambda functions, what they output will be in that array. Just like remember we saw the user and email, it's gonna be an array with those two things. And it, one can go faster and the other doesn't matter, it'll wait for both of them to finish. Then you can do the start user free period with that input of that array of those two things, the email and the other one. So that start user free period, we get the array of both things, the email and the user. And instead of writing code, we can just send the confirmation email via SNS. We can send the SNS message and wait for them to respond. So the step function, Looks like it stops here, but it doesn't. And it's actually going to wait for that SNS to take how many other days, weeks it takes for that person to account. It'll retry after a week and maybe try it again. Say, hey, just letting you know, we haven't gotten your response. Please try again. And so the step function will keep trying to some independent point. So that's how it would work with API gateway pointing to it. Whatever it responds with is what comes back in the JSON response. And so you could actually respond quicker, but in this case, we're going to wait for the SNS. So... If you look at how we would break this down into that stump function, before we do that, I want you to look at this code and do a thought exercise. Where does this code fail? And if it did, how would you find out? So even if you're using a Lambda, you'd probably have to go through logs. You may have intentional throws you created that are very like iconic because the error has a very specific keyword you can search for in CloudWatch metrics, or maybe Datadog spots it, or Elk, if you're using Elk Kibana, for example, or Logstash. How would you see that? How would you know what line of code it broke, right? It's like normal debugging problems exacerbated because you're looking through CloudWatch or various other tools, right? Um, so I want you to keep that in mind. How would you go about doing that? So while you're thinking about that, let's talk about retry. Retry is interesting because there's two types of people and there's the developer who has done this solution and the developer who has done, not done it yet. They haven't actually tried to build that thing. And so the person who's done it may have a bias or an appreciation because they've already done it, they already figured it out, and the other person's like, well, you haven't done it my way. And so both are valid, okay? 
Retry is one of those things where if you've tried to write a retry function, so for example, if validate request failed, how would you retry that function? Would you call it again? Would you use a for loop? Would you use a set timeout? Would you use recursion, right? You, you, you'd go through all those ways and try them to see how they feel, and then you'd arrive at a solution that you think feels good. Then you'd try to apply that to HTTP calls. Then you'd try that to encryption and then regex calls. And then you'd see it gets really hard to abstract for each one of those that are sync, async, long, like regex, you know, you want to have a timeout on those things because they can be very CPU intensive. How does that work? And that, that's where you start getting an appreciation for if somebody has a retry that they built and it works well, let's use that because I've done that. Scroll bars, perfect example. I wrote three scroll bars because I thought I could do a better job than the author. It made me appreciate how awesome that author scroll bar was because I could never get it quite as cool as his, right? So cons, think retry, okay? How would you retrace this? So create user. A lot of times West, US West too, won't as have, it won't have as many resources allocated to East. And the reason for that is because Amazon just doesn't put the, is the, the rates as high because most people use East and it's smart, right? A lot of us in some big companies, we have to intentionally fall back to West and test out, can our code work in just West? Can it work in West by itself? Can, it can't talk to East? Can it work in both, right? And that's a very powerful thing. So if one region goes down, and so it's notorious for failing in West. So we just had retry code. No one will work in East, but in West, we, we we're okay with a little bit of latency as long as it works, okay, within a few seconds. And so how would you retry get user inside the promise at all? Somewhat straightforward, but maybe not. And then they're both HTTP calls. So whatever code you write, at least it'll work for HTTP calls, which is pretty cool. But they're also parallel. So a lot of, lot of challenges around retry, for example. All right, so remember when I asked you what failed? I know you've, we've walked through step functions, but assume you've never seen step functions before, or it's 3 a.m. and you're exhausted because you got a page. Where did this step function fail? <laughs> like, if, if you weren't paying attention earlier, you would immediately know the create user. It's red, right? It's like, oh, it failed there. So you could click on it and see the error of exactly why it failed. So none of this digging through logs, like within milliseconds, you go, all right, file drill averted. It's not my fault. The stream service posted a schema change. Not my problem, right? Like, this, that's awesome. That, that's what you want to see is immediate failure, okay? So parallel state, just like a promise at all. So we take that other code and we convert it to a step function. That's how we would do it. It's a promise at all. And retry, it's literally a built-in function of a step function. I'm going to show you the YAML version just so it's a little bit easier to read than JSON sometimes. Yeah, I'm not a YAML fan. Let's be clear. <laughs> it's just easier for teaching. So you can look for error equals. Anytime you extend an error, the error base class in JavaScript, Whatever you put this.name in the constructor, that's the name of your error as a string. So for example, states.timeout, that's built into step functions. That looks for a state that takes too long. But OAuth failed, that's yours. You could put whatever string you want in there. And you say, if I get an OAuth failed, I want you to retry on this. But if I get like a timeout, don't retry. And you can switch on those errors. So error equals says, if the error is this, do this. If the error is this, do this. Now, I want to only try on those two. All the rest, I'm just going to immediately fail. But this one's worth retrying because if OAuth failed or maybe it took too long because the, the, the OAuth service is really busy, go ahead and retry. But what you don't want is 200 step functions all retrying at the exact same time because then you have a service that's overburdened. It's like, oh gosh, I'm really, I'm overwhelmed. I got a thousand concurrent requests. My TPS is so high. Oh my gosh. And then 2,000 people go, yo, uh, you're not responding. Retry. <laughs> like that beats up the service, right? So what you do is you wait a second and there's a little bit of jitter built in. Like you don't have to code it. It's, a, it's not perfect, but the step functions don't all run exactly at the same time. So there's a little bit of jitter, but I encourage you to create your own. Jitter just means randomness. So they're not 200 exactly waiting a second, if that makes sense. So interval seconds, how, how long do you wait after a retry? Cool, I wait a second and then I try again. Now, how many times when I back off, do I do exponential back off? What is the back off rate? It's a number that you multiply interval seconds by. So if I wait one second, I fail. Okay, try again. Then I wait the interval back off rate 1.5. So I wait 2.5 seconds. Then I multiply 2.5 by 1.5 and try again in that many seconds, right? And so two is an easier number. The math is way easier. It's like one, two, four, eight. Like even an art student can do that math, right? If you're an art student like me and you hate that math, I got a little thing down here. If you go to that link, it's an app that'll do the math for you. I built it in Elm and there's source code for it. But that's, that's it. And so when I say retry, I mean anything. 
booting up an ECS cluster, sending a SQS message that some other service is going to do some work, your code deployment, talking to your Lambda function, whatever. Like it works for everything, which is just absolutely amazing. And it respects the timeout of the function itself too. So if you set a timeout, it's good, good there. So retry is probably like, to me, the coolest thing because this guarantees a higher likelihood at the cost of latency that your code will work. And that's amazing. Absolutely amazing. All right. So that's the concept of what they do is orchestrating Lambda functions, orchestrating microservices, orchestrating anything. But you've seen how orchestrating, basically, you, you don't want to call Lambda to Lambdas. But if you have a step function, orchestrate those calls. It's fast. You have an interface with ARNs, versions, and you still you don't incur any of the latency and you don't have to go through REST. You could if you want, but you don't have to. So that's where it's really awesome. There's still some some caveats with how do you deploy a Lambda function version that doesn't do your step function. That's where I recommend green blue. There's other strategies. So we're gonna talk about the strangler pattern. So this image I took from one of Dave Farley's videos. I'll link it up in the, the cards. He's a wonderful programmer who's been around the block and he's, or at least he talks about it, but he's part, part of the reactive manifesto. And he just can explain really complex topics like domain-driven design, behavior-driven development, test-driven development, continuous integration, and these really bite-sized videos that are 15 minutes pair programming. You don't know what it is. You watch this video, you're ready to do it, right? Because it's not only educational, but he gets you pumped like to do a good job and like raise the bar. It's great videos. So he talks about how Netflix and others and, and a variety of companies, when they do microservices, they don't always start with greenfield development. They're not starting from scratch. Sometimes they have vendor products or old technical debt, and it works. It runs the business. How do you convert that to microservices? And so we're using a strangler pattern here, and this is where if you want to go to step functions, but you don't have a bunch of little lambda functions, or maybe you, you have one big one. It's a lambda lith. It's a monolith in a lambda. How do you use a strangler pattern to go to microservices? You can put it in step function. This is the opposite way. And this vine, I forget what it's called, Strangler vine in Australia, but what it does is it wraps around a tree and kind of forms a cocoon. The tree dies and it uses that as scaffolding to, to build itself up to get to the sun. And so that's kind of, kind of what you do in these microservices where you have this monolith, you build one little microservice that does the same functionality. You have this call that instead. And you keep doing that for little pieces. Eventually, you have no mono, monolith left because you just have all the little pieces that it did. So I'm going to show you how to go from monolith or lambda lith into or factor using the stringer pattern in the step function. So let's say you start with a lambda lith, or maybe you have an express app that's on an EC2. You just install the express adapter for lambda, put it in the lambda. Congratulations, you're learning serverless. Fantastic. It's an anti pattern. I don't care. I think it's a great way to learn, and that's how you do it. So you have an API gateway pointed to that. Step two, one, is you wrap it with a step function. So your API gateway, instead of pointing to lambda, it, instead of pointing to a lambda, it points to the step function. And the step function calls the lambda, takes the output, returns it to the user. Fantastic. So there's no difference there. You just did put it in the step function. No code, no logic, just call the lambda. Cool. So that's step one. That verifies you're now in step function land. Step two is you find the easiest input. In this case, validate request. The first thing is, I validate request is true or false. Cool. So the same code, but really teensy cleaned up, and you don't have to change the lambda lift. It's so small, you could like, here, validate the event again, <laughs> right? Just to verify it didn't work. And that's cool, validate request is true or false, goes to the lambda lift, we're good to go. And so that's, that's a, a little small way to peel off that. And you keep peeling. You take the create user, you take the generate email, right? And you, you do those things, you put it in there, and you remove that from the lambda lift, and eventually you have all these little microservices that do all this stuff. And then you delete code. So instead of sending the confirmation email with Lambda code, you just do the native integration in SNS. Good to go. So that's the three-step process to go from a Lambda lith using the Schengler pattern to put it inside a bunch of little Lambda microservices or functions that's orchestrated by that step function. That's how you do it. Now, let's talk about why this is beneficial from beyond just the microservice aspect. So I'm assuming you already know about the benefits of microservices and the massive amounts of cons. One of the pros to me that's not talked about a lot is the massive big bowl of mud. Every single code base that you're going to work on in your career, you're going to encounter one where you finally get to start from scratch and you get to work on a client or a contract or the code base for years and you hate it after years. You loved it when you started 
But after a while, even if you try to give it love, it just becomes this mess of spaghetti code and there's either a little or a lot of technical debt and you just don't like it. You might, it might be okay or you might hate it. And the, the constant that I've seen in my career around that is because of code size. It doesn't matter how good the code is. If there's so much of it, even if it's unrelated and compartmentalized, it's so difficult to change and fix it because it's so big. And it's very difficult to do that with risk and blast rate is because it affects the whole thing. And so I found if you can start small and keep things small with scope creep, put the scope creep elsewhere. So most scope creep comes for you as the developer and it keeps going into your code, right? It comes from all angles, product owner, businesses, users, things you learned about how to do things better. If you can deflect that scope creep to other places that don't affect you, then your code base can, can grow and, and be affected by entropy, but not get too big. And that's one of the nice things that microservices do because they can do one thing, one thing well, grow, but they don't grow that big, okay? So here's an example of a search service. We had, it was a monolith server and it had about 68 JS files and around 4,000 lines of code. It wasn't that big. That It only had one route, but it did so much sophisticated search stuff that I was checking on it and I'm like, wouldn't it be cool to do an exercise to decompose this? So using the strangler pattern, how would I do that? How would I get that? Here's the gains, for example. If I were just to do validate event, it's two files, the Lambda function itself and the unit test and integration tests all in that, that single test file. So two files, 40 lines of code. Now let's say tra traditionally code always grows three times the size over its lifetime, right? So in two years, dude, that's like 90 lines of code. <laughs> Maybe four files because I added like in the end test in some other module because it just got too big. Like four files, 90 lines of code, like that's epic. Like, that's fantastic. I'd be fine with, oh man, that's so bad. Uh, you want to write it and go? You go right ahead. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, that's amazing. And the blast radius is good. You know, all that other stuff you get with microservices comes along with it. So I, I, I wanted to bring that because I thought that was very poignant. Now we've, we've got a data product that I worked on that had a very similar thing. We had about like, I don't know, seven or nine different little functions. So you could call them microservices. I call them functions, whatever. I, I think of as functions because they didn't deal with rest. They didn't deal with stuff. They were literally just inputs and outputs but they did have a very specific domain they were, they were looking for. And so one of these was responsible for putting files on S3 on a bucket, and it was written in Python. Uh, I'm sorry, it was written in JavaScript and had Python for a lot of the testing. And when we started, you know, it had like two files, 297 lines of code, and it grew to seven files and had 861. And that was over eight, about 18 months, okay? And then we had the same thing. We had a SOAP service that would... We call a soap service and convert it to JSON because we're not going to use XML soap and step functions, right? We all speak JSON. That was written in Go because it was a sheer amount of data that did it. So most of it was in JavaScript, but Go, you know, we could, we could change the language. And even that grew exponentially. Again, the same almost three times increase. But it's still not that big. It's still approachable and still manageable, and we don't hate the code base, right? I want you to look at the end because most of the scope creep in business logic is really how do you orchestrate these things. If else, do this. If I do this, then do this. Like that's where the state machine comes on. I'm modeling, if you're using a type language, for example, I'm modeling that stuff. You can see the increase in the step function itself was massive. That's JSON, okay? It went from one JSON file to three JSON files. Massive, massive increase in, in size of the code too. Now again, a thousand lines of JSON isn't gigantic, but the increase over 18 months is. And so that should tell you, like, that was low code. That was not code that I had to write. That was using Amazon's tools to generate that stuff for me and constantly iterate it, okay? So when we talk about big ball of mud, the, the step function that gives you the best tools to compensate is the one that's going to grow the most. So that's a perfect alignment. That's amazing. This is where I think next to retry, this is probably the most important part of this presentation is you see that and you go, wow. Like that's where I can offload my biggest drama is to like let Jeff Bezos handle that problem. That's, that's amazing. Now, last thing I want to point out is application planning. So state machines, when you're trying to go from this, you know, monolith and, and tear it out, what they do is they also can grow. So you're not stagnant, right? The biggest problem with innovators dilemma is that you have this old thing, you want to build a new thing and you only have finite resources. You can't put every code on the new thing, so you have to maintain the old thing. But you want to migrate away, so you're not adding features to the old thing. It's a very challenging thing to do. And so that's not stagnant. You still have users that need features. You still got to add stuff, right? And you need to see what that is. 
it's very difficult to see that in code. You, as a product owner, you rely on your developers to do the best they can to articulate what the strategies are. If they know how to do those strategies, how do I, how do I use the strangler pattern to to move this off, right? Well, step functions, state machines in general are a really compact version of your app. You can see what your app does and you can add things to it because it generates it. A lot of low code got really bad impressions because they just never changed. It was very difficult to change things, right? Like visual, what was it? Not visual source state, but like the, the, the access, the, Microsoft access, it was ways of changing things, Fox Server Pro. There's a lot of wonderful low code tools, but not all of them. It was just easier to write code when it got to a certain size or a certain scope, or just it was too hard to do with a round trip. Like UML is a perfect example. That's not really true with step functions. They can not only grow and, and, and form as kind of an application plan, but you can you can see it grow over time and visualize that scope creep. And 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 when they say, Well, why don't we know this? Well, you can point to your product owner and say, Why didn't you know this? Like you, you, you didn't know this spot, <laughs> right? You can point that out. So here's an example of how our app started, okay? We knew we had a SOAP service, we had to authenticate, we had to encrypt that data, count how many files from that data. Once we counted, we did a for loop. You can do for loops and step functions by just throwing to another Lambda and, integrate, and, and incrementing a number. Once we're done counting, we put these files on a bucket and then zip them, and that was it. That was the job, right? 18 months later, we had this. <laughs> same app, does the same thing. It gets files, counts them, and zips them. But we learned so much. And th these weren't really new requirements either. Same requirements. So like the, the user didn't actually ask for anything. And this is a perfect example of how we can in see the evolution of scope, see what we learned, but it's the same app and the step function can keep up. You can visually see your app. You can continue to plan and recognize what the reality of it now is. You can check out the old version in GitHub and compare. And there's a couple of things I want to point out too. So hybrid architectures, we talk about service a lot, but we were using batch to do some really heavy lifting that worked out really well. So we could orchestrate that health checks lambdas just because you deploy them doesn't mean they don't break. So for example, if I do a health, like how do you ping a Lambda? How do you do a health check, <laughs> right? Do you call it and the input's bad? Does it throw an error? No, you say, hold on. If this is a ping, respond with a 200. I'm good, right? Don't do any logic. Step functions need the same thing. People can ninja change IAM roles and policies on you. AWS has certain rules about those things. Your infrastructure could have a security group that breaks. There's a lot of things that you might have changed any code done in deployments and it could break. So having a health check is wonderful. Wire that up to Datadog, get paged on it. Like that's fantastic, right? How do you do a health check in a step function? You have to look for that input. It's asking for that health check. We also did a kind of pattern matching. So if you're not familiar with functional programming, Pattern matching is where it's like a switch statement that can't possibly fail. So you have a switch statement that has a default and it always responds with something, right? You get every single possible angle of a switch statement. So we pattern match and we said, look, the zip could fail. We, we could try to make files and it could fail, but also there might be nothing to zip. So a lot of times every single failure was a fire drill and freak out. It's like, hold on, hold on. This is different. This is not our problem, yeah. right? There's a big difference between a failure that's not your fault and a failure that's your fault, right? And so this, is, this happened a lot which is great because now we can confidently say, see that box? It's green, nothing to zip, but we're gonna warn you on it, but it's not a problem. So the step function, as far as we know, worked. Our code worked, but we didn't deliver the value to the customer, so we still alert on it and go to a failure state. But that's fantastic. It's very clear that this is different than this. You can see it, right? Instead of code, like looking around at logs and stuff. And then lastly, when you have an explosion, you wanna be as idempotent as possible. Step functions were originally created for things that aren't idempotent, right? You can't run the same delete five times and not have an error because the file is deleted the first time. So we would have a separate thing to clean the bucket, clean up our mess. There's a lot of other opportunities to, to clean you know, stuff that we created. And also see this over here, this new execution and child execution. You'll have a problem with your history. Let me show you the, the console real quick. So the issue with the if execution event history is it also has a limit. I can't remember if it's like 20,000 or whatever events, but the good news is that function can run for a long time, but every time it transitions and goes to another state, you're gonna incur another history. It's gonna add an event that happened and you don't wanna run out because the step function will just stop. So one way to get around that is to call the step function again. The step function can recursively call itself. So you actually put the arn of itself in there and it can call itself recursively. So that allows you to execute for a while, 
And then when you run out of execution history steps, you can literally call yourself and start again where you left off. The input to your step function is now the input to the other one. So normal recursion, but in this case, you can guarantee that you never run out of event history execution. So again, we that, yeah, another thing that we learned going over time, incorporating that into the design of the application. So really good when you're doing a stringer pattern, you're still not gonna stop innovating. And so step functions can keep up with that application planning. They can form kind of like the, the, the blueprint of your app and they can innovate while you're strangling off new services and orchestrating things, adding new features, right? It's just because you're doing both, right? Which is, they can do both, which is amazing. That's the stringer pattern if you wanna go the other way. You don't start with microservices that you wanna orchestrate or instead you have a monolith and you wanna rip off little pieces of it. The last thing they're really, really good for, beyond waiting for, you, for people, is distributed data. Distributed data via the Saga pattern. So if you're familiar, not familiar with Saga, think about like Redux Saga. If you've heard that in React, it was one of the alternatives to Redux Thunks, where if you want to do an asynchronous operation in Redux, you would usually use some kind of Thunk return a promise instead of doing an immediate dispatch. Saga was when you wanted to do multiple changes, and sometimes you wanted to have your state machines talk to other state machines. So if you're familiar with xState, they have the actor pattern, very similar to Erlang, where you're sending messages to other actors. Same concept. So Saga is just a, a euphemism for you have a lot of things of state that could possibly change. Distributed data is similar to databases. So let me, let me give an example. Again, I'm going to copy Jan C because he's amazing. So his blog, he talks about the Saga pattern. The issue is, is that a lot of microservices have their own data stores. And it's, it's sometimes a good thing because they're managing their own data. The issue is when you need to orchestrate all of those things together and then one of them fails. So here's the happy path. We book a hotel, we're good. We book a flight, we're good. Book a rental. I would do the same thing when I work for Accenture every Saturday or Sunday, depending on how slack I was. I would use Carson Wagon Lit, I think it's called, and I would book my hotel in my rental usually weeks in advance. I'd book like you know week one, week two, week three. The flight, I would usually wait because sometimes if you book before, you could choose flights, seats would come available. Sometimes the seats you'd usually want to book at least a week in advance, but the, the flight time, sometimes you'd have to book last minute because I didn't know I was flying to a client until Sunday, right? I just didn't know. Depends on the weather and, you know, if we got the account and things like that. So what happens when one of these fails? You have to undo everything. So a lot of databases are built on like, let's say ACID compliance. I'm not going to talk about base. So ACID means do you agree to commit this data? We do a bunch of transactions. We're going to write to this column. We're going to add to this value and we're going to write to this column and then we're going to write to this table. Are, is everyone cool with this? Cool. Then it commits. If any of those things break, it rolls all of it back. And so it's ACID compliant, right? You can guarantee it either wrote or it didn't without all these actions. It, that doesn't mean anything when you have three things doing ACID compliance at random times because then they all might write, they all might fail. You don't know. It's exponential. So you have to roll it back. And so here's an example. I book a hotel and it fails. It might have actually written in the database, but not have been successful. We don't know. But what we're going to do is roll back and cancel hotel. Then we're going to fail the state machine. So the state machine is in a failure state, but at least we've cleaned up our mess. So we can say, hey, something failed, but we're still okay. You can relax. I clean everything up. Now, if you book a hotel and a book a flight, you got to undo both. So if book a hotel works, but flight fails, you got to cancel your flight then cancel the hotel. So both of those databases have to be cleaned up. And then when catast a catastrophic thing happens, where you book a hotel flight and rental and they all break, you have to undo all of them and then go to a failure state, okay? And so this is where the concept of like, I, I need to do a bunch of things with a bunch of data. And if even one doesn't work, I have a very particular order. I have to undo and clean up things. So I want very deterministic code that's idempotent as possible. And if it's not then it doesn't create a disaster when it explodes, right? You don't want to create a blast radius that destroys things when you have failures. You want to do your best to clean up your mess. And so here's another example where I'm helping this woman at work and she's doing streaming data. So you can't undo event sourcing. Event sourcing, if you're not familiar, is very similar to GitHub or GitLab, where you check in a change and you check in another change. You're not actually checking in all your code, right? At the, like the first time you do. Every check-in is actually just the changes to that code. And so the only way to get the latest code is to replay all the changes, right? That's how it works. You're actually just checking in changes. That's what event sourcing means. And so she's parsing a mainframe file. And from that, she's going to insert it into Dynamo into a, a, a nice little structure because the mainframe is all like weird format. I don't even know what it is, Epsidic or something crap. It's probably weirder than that. 
and you parse it and convert it to a nice little JSON and shove it in Dynamo. And then you send a, a message to say, hey, at this time we got this mainframe file and it was successful, right? And you have like a nice little audit trail of streams that come in, okay? What happens when you fail? <laughs> like, like, what happens? Do you send a success? No, you gotta send a failure. So you stream that failure. So you, if, if it fails, make sure you clean up that mess in Dynamo and then send a failure. So completely different code path that this state machine does not show. What about when this fails, the stream? Well, if the stream success fails, then you've got to send a stream failure that I couldn't stream. <laughs> so then I have to undo the data paste, right? So I, I, I need to have that audit trail. Both have to work. And so I try to show an example of if I were to build this in a step machine, a state machine, how would that work? And I would insert into Dynamo, and if that failed, I would delete from Dynamo, and then if the stream failure failed, I would go to a fail state. If the stream fail succeeded, I would still go to the fail state, right? Because we failed. We didn't parse the mainframe file successfully. You didn't write to Dynamo. But there's one bug that this visually illustrates. We could probably see this in code, yes, but it's a lot easier to see here. What happens when you parse the mainframe file successfully? You insert into Dynamo, and then the stream is successful. You don't go to a failed state. Like if you, if you go stream success and that throws an error. You, what you then do is then go to stream failure, then go to failure state. So even here, you're missing a step. And so you can visually see that without writing code. You can just throw this up there and call it a day. So it's very clear if we're in success or failure, very deterministic, but all the data behind it is not <laughs> deterministic. It's not a Boolean yes or no. Like there's a lot of undo and orchestration around that and that's exactly what step functions do very, very well. All right, so let's give you some tips and tricks, that, some of the things that I've learned, some minor stuff. Input and output is really, really hard with serverless because there's some constraints, right? API gateway, 10 megs, awesome. Lambda, six megs, still pretty cool. Application load balancers do one meg. So a lot of file operations are immediately out, right? You can do S3 partial, where you upload pieces of it around five megs, and that can kind of work with application load balancers. If you put pieces of it, it's just, it's, it can be done, it's just hard. Step functions can do 256. It used to be like 32K or something. So what you end up doing is abstracting that. You have step functions that call step functions. So for example, a Lambda will output this big JSON block. You probably don't need the whole thing. So the step function can snag off just a piece, just a piece it needs so that, that you, you just get the data you need. Step functions can do the same thing. You have a step function that gets this input and gets this small output. It just lets you know, hey, this worked or here's the data that I got from it. That way the other step function gets a little bit of data. So when you start doing parallel, you know, parallel processing or, you know, um, doing a bunch of things at once, you still don't have an exponential grease increase in JSON. So 256K is hard, but it can be mitigated by abstracting into other step functions. Again, AWS constantly wants you to create more stuff on AWS. Right? It's just funny how that works. Mapping. So we haven't talked about mapping. Mapping is very different than parallel. Mapping is when you want to do very similar to promised at all, but with each promise gets a dynamic input. So for example, if I do a normal map in JavaScript, I have a bunch of inputs. It's going to call that function four times, and it's going to call cook with cow, cook with potato, cook with chicken, and cook with corn. Right? Whatever the output, it's going to put in the array. So very similar to promised at all, but each one. A parallel would give you the same input to all of those. Map is going to create four in this case, four of that same map block. And where's that useful? Well, let's say you're writing a Dynamo or any database or any downstream system that has some back pressure problems, and you don't want to involve SQS. Okay which is not as deterministic with state machines because that, that's a reactive architecture. We're talking about orchestration. Dynamo has something called a write and read capacity. Write capacity means how many times can I write? And generally it'll work. I say generally because you get a hot partition and maybe you can only write 90 times in your throttles. It could happen. So we're going to say 100 writes, but we have 400 items we need to write. What do you do? I, I, if I create write to Dynamo in a map and I have a, a given an array of 400 things, it's going to write immediately to to Dynamo, and that's not good. Map has this amazing, amazing feature called max concurrency. So I'm gonna link it directly to Dynamo. So if that map, I pass an array of 100 things, it would create 100 put item calls all at the same time and write to Dynamo. But Bluebird, if you're not familiar, is a promise library for JavaScript. It has a bunch of neat little list comprehensions, very similar to Lodash, but Map has something called max concurrency. So if you have 100 promises, it'll only actually run three at a time. And as soon as one's done, it'll run the next one, but never, ever, ever above three or whatever you set that max to. Map and step functions do the same thing. You can set a max concurrency 
on that map and it'll only run 300, whatever you wish. And so that way you can not inundate your downstream services and the stuff function deals with the back pressure. It's, think of it like a queue that handles that. It's fantastic. All right, so how do we test this stuff? Unit testing. Unit testing, at least with step functions, is a little more like integration testing, but mainly end-to-end -end tests because you're testing all the things, and you need to test all the things. We'll talk about why in a minute. So you can do step functions that start execution or start sync execution if you want, but I just do start execution. Start sync, that should be, should be uh, sync execution. So it's synchronous. And when I mean synchronous, I mean you wait for the step function to complete. If you call start execution, this will actually just be a, I started, here's the execution ID. It won't actually wait for the step function to finish. So that should be start sync execution. Apologies for that. So you're looking for a succeed or default. So that would be the end and test of all the things. Why do we end and test it? I'll, I'll, I'll talk about that in a minute. Here's a step function coke wrote. <laughs> Look at the size of this thing. Does it work? Do you have an automated way to check? Right, perfect example of why end and tester are fantastically, you should know that. So let's, let's, let's go back to the test real quick. There's a lot of reasons you should do this. First is IAM roles, they can change. You, you might have built your step function, you're ready to go, and you realize you don't even have permission to invoke Dynamo. You can invoke all these lambdas, but you forgot to put the Dynamo DB put item in your IAM role. So that's a perfect example of why you want to test everything. Second, a lot of the lambdas, the inputs might look good in the, the step function, but they might be formatted wrong or you misspelled something because it's JSON. It's not like TypeScript, for example. And so you just miss fat finger or something. That's okay. But these end to end tests will find that very quickly. Also, outputs. The lambdas could be outputting JSON that you're not expecting. Maybe somebody deployed something and they didn't use green blue or they didn't use versioning and your lambdas is not working. So you definitely want to test the outputs. State machine you can screw it up in a variety of ways. So although it compiles, it might go to the wrong state and you, oh, I, I had my, my choice state backwards. I was supposed to do if true, not if false, for example, right? And you wouldn't know that until you run an end and test. And you wouldn't know if you broke it unless you run an end and test. So it's very, very important to have around. Also, there, there's bugs in lambdas, man. There's bugs in batch. People deploy code, it breaks. So and, and step function, he's the one that orchestrated it. He'll find the bug, right? It's fantastic. Also, the bigger your step function get, the more complex it gets. Like that Coke one I showed you. I mean, that's, that's you, you want to test that. You want to have automated tests around that feel good and confident that you can release anything around that to prod. And that's where the end end tests come from. So let's talk about types. Because a lot of people talk about types from a, a, a code perspective that should make step functions, although they're using JSON, we're not using schemas, it should make it like infallible, right? Well, at least in JavaScript, and this is kind of true for Python too. The contract for object-oriented programmers sometimes, and definitely for imperative programmers, is try-catch. They're fine with the two separate code paths. Functional programmers are not. Go programmers are not. We talk about functions that have, they either worked or they didn't. And if they did, here's the data. And if they didn't, here's the error. And that's a very imperative functional way of doing things. So here's TypeScript, okay? We thought we are getting a Boolean, but then it throws an error. So why did TypeScript say it was a Boolean? It should have been Boolean or throw an error. Now I know TypeScript doesn't have throwable, but it's lying to us. This is one of the type holes that TypeScript has. It doesn't really embrace the fact that JavaScript is an imperative language that has two code paths, right? You can either do try catch or you can just write types and assume nothing ever fails and nothing ever throws, which is not always true. Now you can do happy path, that's fine, but that's not what the types do. Functional programmers, and it's strictly a functional language, not F sharp, not OCaml, would say, no, no, we got a result. And the, the function could fail, if it's result okay, here's your Boolean. If it failed, it's result.error, here's your error. Very similar to Go. And that's what we would do. But that's not how step functions work. That's not how a lot of AWS works. What you really should do, whether for JavaScript or Python, is you should go by that contract. If you return data, the step function will get it. If you have a problem, you should throw an error, or in Python's case, raise. And the reason is, is I know I'm a functional programmer saying to throw exceptions, which is blasphemy, I understand. But the retryability in lambdas, and the retry button and step function, that's the contract. That's how it works. It's fantastic. And so what you should be is more pragmatic. Have a promise that gets your data, but if not, it, it rejects. So if it's synchronous, it's a throw. If it's asynchronous, which all lambdas usually are, then a promise like that. So if you're using TypeScript, you should really think more about promise boolean if, if those functions can fail, because then you're doing the contract of the step function, and that's what we want, okay? And this would be like the code version of it. Basically, it tries your lambda, gets a result. If it doesn't, it throws an error, and then you can do the retry, or the error handling, if you would like, you can do error handling too. You don't always have to retry. You can say, well, if I get an error, just give up. And that's fine too. Step functions can handle the error. We've covered a lot about step functions. So again, 
Step functions are for orchestrating serverless microservices using low code. Orchestrating serverless just means Lambda functions, having functions that call functions, but they're not actually doing Lambda invoke. The step function is doing it on your behalf. It's orchestrating all that JSON between that. It's massaging that JSON the way you want. It's integrating with other services natively, like S3 and Dynamo and other step functions. You can abstract these things to handle the data throughput and just make it easier on yourself. And it interfaces with a lot of other things too. And if you don't have serverless stuff, you have servers, you can do activity tokens and just give it to the server. So you can still interface with servers that aren't necessarily serverless. You just give them a token, they can do some work, right? And you can interface with them in a reasonably deterministic way with a timeout if they never respond to a heartbeat, for example. And SNS, I keep harping on it, but it's my favorite, is you can just wait for people. They can run up to a year. So a lot of times you'll use EventBridge or CloudWatch cron jobs to start these things and these processes for data, for example. But you could also run a step function that just does a for loop or constantly, you know, like a light switch. It stays, there's no end, right? You can do that and that's fine. It runs up to a year. And lastly, fun step functions can call step functions. You can do recursion. And the reason you do that is because you run out of execution history. So if you have a step function that calls a step function, you can get around the execution history limit because you just start a new step function. The UI will actually show what function called what function. So you can open a bunch of browser tabs and see it. And so that, that, that's a, another nice way of not just calling a step function and getting the output, but ha calling yourself. If you think the step function is calling itself. Okay. And again, you can immediately see when something broke. I mean, this is like when you're ever doing a new technology, there's always a concern about is it going to work? How are developers going to learn this? And we're going to put this in prod and have learn. Is management, upper level senior management, are they okay with taking that risk? Are they okay with that? And having our developers invested in learning this, do they believe in it? This is where step functions really shine because like, ah, here's what's wrong. <laughs> they immediately tell you. So there's no hidden like all oh, this Lambda servo stuff so weird. We don't know how to debug it. Like, dude, it can't get any easier in a big red block in exactly what part broke. That's just fantastic. It's wonderful. Handling rollback. Again, they're really good at handling rollback. So they do orchestration. You can refactor them with a strangler pattern and they do distributed data, right? You can undo distributed data and clean up your mess. Increase your ability to do idempotency with a ton of distributed architecture. That's awesome. So if you want to learn more, the AWS Step Function documentation is actually really good. It'll take you through all the states, the air handling, the retry, all that stuff. And Jan C. Blogs, I mean, he's just, he's amazing. He's got actually a Step Function class on there. Free, you can, I think it's free, I don't know. But if it's not, it's worth paying. He's, he's just a great blogger, great writer, good speaker. And if you're a UI developer and you want to use some of this stuff on UI, XState would be the equivalent. It has a visual UI, has all kinds of, hooks for JavaScript, you can use it in React or any, you know, things represent well beyond router, right? You want to have a state of your, your app, you can see it. You know, so it's very hard to visualize MobX and Redux, for example, right? X state's great. And you can have these distributed state machines where they send via the actor pattern. They can talk to each other. It's crazy stuff. So there's a free X state course if you're interested in getting a really good introduction to it on egghead.io. And more videos for me, like I said, my app exponential back off retry calculator, if you want to do the math, for when you should do back exponential back off. I got an app written in Elm and I got the source code there if you want to rewrite it yourself. I've also got some serverless tips I learned just all of 2021. I took everything I learned and just wrote it down basically from the year at the time I made the video. And I was really thinking about testing and trying to teach people testing because it's a different thought process for doing serverless. So you unit test locally, integration test, you're testing things there. You're using the step function is kind of a gateway to do end-to-end -end testing. Interesting concept of how you do that. So that presentation I have for there. And offloading state to AWS. A lot of people forget that you don't have to do as many side effects if you offload that state to AWS. So it helps in testing as well. And Open Slava, I got to give a talk on trying to do all the orchestration. So it covers this, it covers Lambda. It's a different angle. So it's not just step functions. It's more of like giving an example of how you would parse through all these things. So if you're looking for a different angle, that's a talk I did last year. Hopefully this gets you inspired and excited to try step functions. They're amazing. They're one of my favorite tools and a good thing next to Lambda for serverless. I can orchestrate all this stuff. I can use them for APIs. I can use them for data. I can use them for running background processes, managing distributed data with uh, Dimpotent Rollback. It's amazing. If you got any other questions, hit me up in the comments. Good luck.